Hi there, my name is Ken Mayer. I'm going to be your instructor for this course on Security Plus. Now, I've been back working in this uh, industry and business in some way or another since 1983. Of course, technologies have certainly changed from times when we had very closed systems, mainframes, to uh, getting into the world of actually having a little more open network operating system, to everybody discovering the World Wide Web, uh, to being able to have to worry about routing and switching, about uh, different applications that are running web applications, uh, identity theft, the, the works. And so I've been uh, obviously staying with these topics, working with a lot of different areas of security through those 30-some years that I've been in this business. I'm hoping that I'll be able to uh, give you some of that extra knowledge that uh, will help you make you a better security professional throughout this course. In this lesson, we're going to talk about security fundamentals. And so what we'll do is we'll uh, kind of, like it says, fundamentals, give you that foundation. We'll uh, hit that uh, information security cycle. Uh, then we'll talk about the uh, information security controls. And when we talk about controls, remember, we're going to be kind of what feels like all over the place when it comes to security because there are a lot of different things to think about. We'll uh, take a look at least um, from the uh, 30,000 foot view, the authentication methods, uh, some of the uh, fundamentals of uh, crypto systems or cryptography. And we'll also talk about some of the uh, security policy fundamentals, which, by the way, is where I, I say that's about the paperwork, where we actually write out and make those policies that we use as a guideline for setting up our secure systems. So let's take a look at the information security life cycle. What we're going to do is we'll talk about uh, what information security is, uh, some ideas of what you should be protecting, the goals of security. Uh, we'll uh, throw in some of the words like risk, threats, vulnerabilities, intrusions. Uh, we'll also talk about some of the types of attacks, some of the controls that we can use, types of controls that we have to use. Uh, again, all trying to mitigate risk, really, when it comes down to it. And then we'll look at the security and management process. So when you ask the question, what is information security? Well, you can probably give it just on these basic definitions, the uh, protection of available information or information resources. Now, when we talk about information, I guess you could say we're talking about, for some people anyway, data. Uh, it could be data in a database of customers, maybe their credit cards that you, uh, like so many uh, stores these days, don't want to lose. Uh, it could be other types of resources of information. Uh, literally, it could be information that's on a paper form that uh, needs to be securely locked or stored, files, think about medical records and those types of things. So it's important that you understand what really is important for your company or your organization, and uh, our goal is to provide that protection. Now, it is necessary uh, for the uh, responsible individuals or the organization to uh, have a way of securing confidential information. Just in the United States, we have a number of regulatory laws for a variety of different types of organizations, such as HIPAA for medical records, medical patient information, uh, what we call Sarbanes-Oxley or SOX for financial institutions, banks, and those types of things. That, that, those laws actually say that in order for you to do business without getting a huge fine or possibly even going to prison, that you meet, must need to meet those requirements and be able to document that you've at least met the minimum requirements, especially, let's go back to the bank. If SOX tells us what we need to do minimum and that bank loses your money, uh, do you think maybe somebody might sue that organization if that organization says, oh, we weren't in compliance? It really doesn't look good for those organizations. So anyway, it is necessary, as I said before. And when I say responsible individuals, well, that starts right at the top, whether it's a CEO, sole proprietor who's the owner of the business, who, whatever the, the uh, type of uh, setup is, uh, director of a, of a uh, different agency, they're the ones ultimately responsible. Anyway, uh, when you think about this, our goal is by looking at some of those documentations plus following best practices, our goal is to minimize the risks and other consequences of losing any type of your critical data. So here's where I was uh, talking a little bit about the uh, ideas of what we're trying to protect. The data, the resources, whatever is important. In fact, uh, one of the things I'm going to have to uh, put up here 
is when we ask the question, what to protect, I'm going to say whatever is important to that organization or company. We go back uh, to what's called business needs. Now, business needs means that we need to protect whatever is going to keep that company, assuming it's a for-profit uh, company, in business. If they make widgets, uh, their resources may be for uh, supply line uh, information or, you know, if they're, uh, let's say, a credit card processing, then they're going to have to have a resource that lets them connect out to a variety of different bank buildings. And so we have to be able to protect those connections. And then, of course, internally, like I said, we could have uh, paper files. We could have digital uh, media or digital uh, storage of our files that uh, protect uh, information crucial to how we do business, like it says bank account numbers or, you know, in the U.S., social security numbers or any other personal information. So how do you answer the question? I'm, I'm asking it like a question, what to protect. Again, what to protect is what's important for the business. What makes that business run? And when we are talking about protection, and you're going to be seeing uh, some ideas of what security is, but I'm going to draw just a little bit different uh, idea here about uh, one way to look at security, and that is this idea of CIA, which uh, is not the uh, spy organization, but stands for confidentiality, integrity, and availability. And somewhere in here we have some data some asset that you want to protect. Now, I just wrote it in the middle of this little triangle, and one of the things that you're going to see is that, you know, when it comes to how to protect, and I'm way ahead of where we're going to be coming up to in just a bit, uh, one of the things to remember is that we can protect information through confidentiality by encrypting our data. In fact, we'll often tell you that you should encrypt your data whenever it is in motion or it's at rest. At rest means it's stored on your hard drive, it's stored on your laptop. Encrypt the files. In motion means you're connecting to your bank and doing online banking. Don't do that in clear text, right? We always look for those uh, uh, HTTPS connections. We also want to know that the data has not been changed either while at rest or in motion. That's the integrity or the I. But at the same time, if you were to imagine that, uh, you know, where I place this little dot where my data is, if I start moving my dot a little closer to confidentiality, I may move it away from the ability to do integrity checks and certainly move it away from the A, which is availability. Availability means, can I get to my information? I mean, we could secure information so much that hardly anybody can access it. Well, if they're customer records and that's your business needs to access customer records, you're going to have a tough time here. So, uh, so there's a balance in between all of these that it'll be appropriate to, uh, again, to, what did I say? Uh, the regs, regulations, there'll be a balance that's, uh, that you want to meet there. Uh, and the other one I said it would be best practices. And, uh, and then from there, you can determine based on your own uh, risk assessments, we'll say, of how you want to uh, set up the policies for, set, uh, for uh, coming up with this balance of, of security choices. But anyway, take this to uh, the resource. Now, under resources, I made little connections like these are servers connecting out to other banks from a credit card processing center. You know, the resource is the equipment itself. I mean, if that equipment is not locked in a uh, secure facility, then anybody can walk in there and, you know, potentially walk away with your servers. Let me just uh, say this about servers. Um, you might go through all of this work here, confidentiality, to encrypt your information, which is very important to you. But, uh, and you may say, well, I've got the best of, uh, let's say, Windows security set up on this thing, and I've got antivirus. That, you know, if I can steal your server, and I don't even have to take the entire server, all I have to do is take your hard drive, because technically that's all I want is what's stored there. And if I can walk into that room and I can just uh, pop a hard drive out, then, um, you know, I own your data. I'll, I'll take the time to decrypt it back at my, uh, you know, uh, evil hacker's shack or wherever it is I'm doing the work from. So resources are more than just uh, thinking of data. It's also the equipment, the hardware, everything else that's important. And so, uh, again, going back to what to protect, there's kind of a small list that I've just given you, uh, and, uh, plus a little uh, idea about um, uh, how to decide what way to protect that information. Now, there are some goals of security, and uh, I already mentioned my CIA triangle. 
uh, as uh, kind of the idea of uh, really dealing with uh, actual data. That was more for just data. But when we said uh, what do you protect and what we're doing with security, well, we were talking about data, we were talking about paper files, we were talking about actual server hardware, uh, you know, even uh, protecting your personnel. I know of a company that does a lot of financial work for some of the bigger credit card companies around the world. And they tell me uh, that they often have to have security in the parking lot at the uh, quitting time because they'll actually have employees who, as they're walking out to their car, get hit up by people trying to bribe them to get them special access or to get them information uh, about other people's um, you know, financial situations. So, I mean, when you think about the goals of security, one of them is prevention. How do you prevent these different types of, uh, of uh, breaches in security? I mean, again, we've probably all heard, I'm assuming, uh, at least for most of you watching me, that you've all heard of antivirus software, maybe intrusion detection, uh, firewalls, and things that we do to prevent. But, you know, security goes beyond the transmission of those little ones and zeros. It does go to the personnel, it does go to the equipment, to the resources, supply chains. Uh, you know, another part of your security is power supply. I mean, what happens if the power grid goes down where you're at? Uh, do you have backup generators? I mean, all of these things, we could say, well, we can put them in to try to prevent a security flaw. And yes, the loss of power is a security issue because uh, if you can't get the business to run, you're losing money. Of course, detection. Now, detection is where I'd be uh, talking a little bit more about um, your use of uh, scanning software, like I said, antivirus and uh, intrusion detection. Uh, obviously, just in the name of that uh, IDS, right? Intrusion detection. Um, but it goes beyond that again. Physical stuff, right? Motion sensors, sensors on windows, um, you know, having a way of auditing who accesses the server room. And of course, we have to have a recovery system. Recovery is important because the loss of downtime for some organizations um, could be so uh, monumentally hard on that company that they may never recover. In fact, I remember reading, I just wish I could quote it to you, so don't take this as pure 100% fact, but I've heard that, that uh, for small businesses, if they were down for a week because they couldn't recover their information, by then their customer base will have found a new supplier of whatever widgets they're selling and uh, they might not recover. So, uh, you know, we want to be able to say in our recovery parts of our goals that we can bring data back right away, that we can uh, recover if we have power outages, that we can recover, right? All of those things go together as goals of our security. Now, the uh, actual idea or definition of risk is, I guess you could say, one, the likelihood that something could happen, and if it did happen, what kind of damage would it do? Uh, and, uh, and a way of doing a rating. There are very uh, simplistic methods of analyzing risk. Uh, if you think about it, you could simply draw a little box and you could uh, put the, uh, uh, what I would call the threat here first. And uh, I'll make my box pretty big. And let's say the threat was a virus uh, to uh, your, your uh, operating systems. Um, then, of course, what do we say? The likelihood, so I'm just going to use a, uh, an L because I don't want to respell that word. Uh, and, and maybe uh, you, you might say, you know, let's have uh, different people do their own ratings of, let's say, from 1 to 5 or 1 to 10. Um, and this would be, you know, end users. They'd be your security um, uh, managers. They'd be your router switch people. Uh, they'd be your firewall experts. They'd be all these people from different parts of your organization who would all have their own uh, opinion on the, uh, the likelihood of that occurring. And then, of course, the next thing we said is the damage. And the damage could be in time, could be in money, could be both. Um, and so, you know, you just come up and say, you know, let's take a look at this. I mean, what about burglary, right? Somebody uh, coming in, what's that likelihood of, uh, of that occurring? Like I said, I always want to think more than just electronic or tech, uh, technical uh, terms when it comes to uh, these threats. How about flood or fire, right? Again, likelihoods and uh, what kind of damage would it do? And that's important. I mean, you know, if you ask me about a virus, I might say, hey, there's a good chance that uh, my end users might download some garbage, so I'd give it a four out of five. I might consider that we have, uh, you know, maybe armed security and outside TVs, and, and so the, the chance of a burglar coming in might be very low, unless I'm worried about an internal employee. Uh, flood and fire, well, you know, you can look up uh, what flood zone you're in to know if that's a high likelihood. 
Uh, you know, maybe I'll say it's a three, uh, maybe a four. Really? Four? Do I want to work in a building that has that high a likelihood to catch on fire? All right, so anyway, you're getting the idea, right? Uh, viruses could be pretty minimal. Uh, you might get a little bit of uh, disruption. You might have to rebuild uh, or re-image some machines. Um, this could be uh, medium, depending on how much a burglar uh, could uh, pull out. And, um, you know, a fire or a flood could be catastrophic, right? See if I can spell catastrophic. Can't use words we can't spell, right? All right, there you go. So anyway, uh, you know, I mean, because, you know, once you have a flood or a fire, we're talking about a building that usually can't be occupied for a while, and that's a lot of downtime. So as I said, uh, you come up with a way. There are plenty of documented methods that you can use to do different types of, uh, of risk. And the idea here is, is you then have to make some decisions with your risk. You have to say, okay, um, you know, something catastrophic um, it, with a high likelihood that I've put in here, seems like that'd be the first thing I'd want to address uh, out of my risk, more than buying antivirus software. I might be saying, hey, we need to put sprinklers in here, we need to update the, the uh, fire extinguishers, you know, all that sort of stuff. Um, you know, and then maybe I'd say, okay, well, the virus looks like it can happen a lot, uh, which, is, uh, which is something we want to deal with. Um, you know, so it's helping you also kind of focus your energies. Now, like I said, when you look at threats, I wrote some down here. Uh, we've got one here like, uh, that, that can be very common, unfortunately. Disgruntled former employees. Now, you know, I'm going to take out the word former because you also have a risk from disgruntled employees who are working for your company and your corporation uh, that might uh, not have the best interest of uh, what your company does, as I said. And, uh, but either way, the idea was that they may, because they've worked there or are working there, that they might try to uh, get improper access to information. Um, you know, I've got a, a person I'm working with in the uh, small town that I live in who uh, just uh, had their uh, sales manager hired by the competition. And, uh, of course, what happened when that sales manager left uh, for, I guess, greener pastures, they try to take all of their customers uh, with them as well, right? Could be a major idea of a disgruntled employee. And by the way, that had nothing to do with technology, that other than maybe the database of uh, who the customers are. But we look at that as risk. Now, the idea of threats is um, the fact that something could happen, right? The risk is, you know, for us to identify the threats and how likely the threat will happen. Um, but we have to identify what those threats are because we don't know what the problem is. Uh, we're not going to have a good chance of trying to prevent it or even know that we should detect it. So um, let's talk about the, uh, just changes to information. The first one here, changes to information. Okay, so changes happen, right? We update our customer records. Uh, you know, I move, I get a new phone number, whatever. You need. So, so some changes we expect. Um, but... There could be the time that somebody made a change to a record, like maybe deleted a customer, not wanting to do it on purpose, but that would make it unintentional. And then we have to ask, what have you done in security to be able to bring that customer's information back? Uh, that would be part of your recovery options that we just mentioned before. Uh, it could also be something intentional. I did read a story about a lady who uh, was um, uh, an architect, right, who would uh, draw out plans uh, for million-dollar jobs and saw that, uh, that uh, her company was advertising for somebody with the exact same uh, job requirements as she had, so she thought she was getting fired. So she intentionally destroyed all of her work and then went and resigned and the next day and said, you know, uh, you're going to fire me anyway, so I'm just going to resign, and yeah, I destroyed all my stuff. And that's when the employer said, well, you know, uh, two things. We were actually hiring somebody to help you, uh, and now we're going to prosecute you for destroying our stuff. Um, you know, that's, uh, again, changes to information. Interruption of services. Sometimes we call that a denial of service on the, um, on the uh, binary side. When I say binary, by the way, I'm talking about the data transmitted from one place to the other uh, across, uh, you know, uh, radio frequency or physical copper cables or fiber channel. It, we're sending a bunch of ones and zeros, and sometimes our goal is to try to stop that. Uh, again, um, interruption of services could also have been, as I said, somebody damaging the, the power grid. Um, you know, there's so many things that, uh, that we can do to, to, to uh, interrupt services. 
Uh, interruption of access, that's also, I would put as a part of this, what we call a denial of service, where sometimes uh, we'll purposely have a hacker try to take your server offline. How? Maybe send it a virus, maybe send it uh, uh, some pre-known types of, uh, of data or information that would cause it to crash. Again, if they don't physically uh, lock these things up, could be damage to hardware. By the way, it could also just be that uh, you don't have the right type of heating and uh, ventilation and air conditioning um, that can also cause damage to uh, your, your uh, different uh, hardware out there. So all of these, right, damage to facilities, again, fire and flood, the rest of it, all of these are threats. As I was just saying before when I talked about risk, we would look at the different threats that could interrupt in our, our ability to work and what is the likelihood that that threat could happen. A vulnerability is often something we would say could be a bug in a system, whether known or unknown. Uh, and that happens. I've never met a company, and you can name any of the big ones, that have, ne have ever put out perfect, perfect software. Uh, it could be a bug that's in the hardware, just the way the uh, hardware chips were encoded with their instruction codes. There's a, a lot of different uh, uh, things that could be a vulnerability. A vulnerability could be an open window or a window that doesn't lock or a door that doesn't lock. Um, you, know, um, it, you know, all of these, again, trying to get away from just the technical aspect, could be considered a vulnerability, a known weakness. And that's what's important is that often we know what the weaknesses are and that's where people are going to try to take advantage of the weakness. I mean, if I knew that uh, some employee was uh, sneaking a smoke inside the office and left their window open when they went out at night hoping they didn't get caught so they could just, you know, blow the cigarette smoke out the window or something, and, and I was paying attention to that while I was watching your company, that to me would be a vulnerability, a way I could come in. And so we want to try to patch a lot of these vulnerabilities. We want to fix them. Uh, bugs, when they're detected, usually will have a, uh, a, a fix or a patch or an upgrade to fix those things. Hardware, mm, yeah, sometimes we can rewrite the, uh, the um, firmware on, on some of these chips. Uh, open windows, again, you could have security guards walking around the outside. I mean, so our goal is to look for these types of uh, vulnerabilities. Now, some of the tough ones when it comes to uh, the world of your operating systems and uh, how we exchange information are these ones we call zero days. A zero day vulnerability is one that the manufacturer does not know exists, uh, one that nobody except for certain groups of, uh, of uh, hackers would know that exists. And, uh, and even if the, the existence of this vulnerability is known, it also means that it's one that doesn't have a patch. And this is your big thing that is affecting us today. Because if we don't know there's a vulnerability and we don't know to patch it, then we have people that are going to be able to take over your networks no matter how good you try. And that's just, uh, that's just a true statement about security. So again, uh, in this little uh, example here, uh, attacker hitting what looks like an unsecured uh, router. So uh, I'm going to mention a, uh, a, a vendor that makes um, these uh, wireless routers, not because they make poor ones. or I mean, you'll, you'll understand. I'm not saying anything bad about it. But I was with a friend at a Thai restaurant, uh, I'm not even going to tell you what state it was, that uh, advertised free Wi-Fi. So he opened up his laptop because he was going to check his email, and he found that this uh, router's uh, SSID was Linksys. All right, nothing wrong with this company, by the way. Makes good products, um, but the problem is, is because the SSID was Linksys, which is the default setting of that router, then he took the guess to say, well, let's see if I can go to its management page of 192.168.1.1 on its IP address, and the management page opened, and so then he said, well, I know that their defaults are username, admin password of admin. So he tried those out and lo and behold, he had full control of that unsecured router. Now, like I said, not an issue with Linksys because you can I can mention a number of different routing companies who every single one of their products out of the box without you doing any configuration are going to be just as unsecure. And we all know that. And unfortunately, so did uh, my friend. Now, he was not a hacker. He was uh, really just curious and actually brought it up to management and said, you know, you ought to do something about it. 
Maybe he was looking for an extra consulting gig. I don't know. But, you know, once I'm into a device like that, um, you know, I can change uh, the way in which uh, your, your traffic goes out. So, or I can use that to, you know, as I said here, to come in here and get into your, uh, inside of your network and your information systems. Because if I can uh, change that, I could, uh, I could, basically, I could have made this a firewall and I could have stopped all your traffic from leaving. That would be a denial of service. I could have redirected your traffic to me as a web server instead of, uh, you know, to your regular Facebook or social media. I mean, so many things that could have been done to uh, really just uh, take care of things. So that's just, again, an example of a vulnerability. And so one of the vulnerabilities, I guess I didn't write it down here, uh, is default settings. Uh, right, we, we, they all are there, and I could probably just keep going on and on with this, but uh, I'm hoping that by now you understand what I'm uh, referring to. It's a weakness in a system. Intrusions are, again, gaining access into an area that you shouldn't be able to get to. Well, notice this one right here, I'm talking about a door. What's in that door? Uh, could it be uh, files, file storage uh, that are paper? Could it be a server room? You know, how is it secured? Is it left unlocked? Is it easy to get into? Right? That's a type of intrusion. You know, in some of my advanced hacking classes, we actually taught uh, students, and it only took 30 minutes, by the way, how to pick any standard tumbler lock or to use a shim to get past any regular uh, padlock, which, uh, you know, I'm just going to tell you, those things aren't secure anyway. Uh, that's where we, we start seeing the magnetic key cards or at least a password encoder device. Uh, something a little more than just a tumbler lock for people to get into. But uh, we have to consider that that could be a destination as a place of intrusion. Of course, it could also be what I'll call electronic, which is just the way in which we speak to different devices. And again, that could be my trying to break in or hack into a system. Uh, that's what a lot of us keep thinking about when we think of the word hacker if somebody's breaking into a server to steal your files or your other data. And, and, you know, if they're successful and able, let's say, to take over one of these systems, then they're, what I would say, golden. Because once they're inside, I mean, even if I had to go through a firewall, once I can take over any system on the inside, there's an idea of trust that once you're in the network, we trust everything else in the network. And so I can then just, from there, start uh, uh, what I call a pivot point. Uh, where I, I take this machine, then I pivot to the next machine or pivot to the next machine and uh, try to own them and then just continue to uh, have my way inside of your, uh, your network. So again, another example of an intrusion. Now an attack, to me, sounds like somebody is trying to uh, basically follow through on this threat or vulnerability. And again, we kind of want to uh, give you this, uh, sometimes people call it a little bit like it's a mile wide of information and maybe not quite as uh, in-depth uh, of information. In other words, we uh, want to make sure you are aware of different types of security issues and problems uh, and have a good, at least if you're aware of it, you know that it's something that should be looked at. For example, you might work solely on firewalls, yet here we are talking about physical security attacks. Again, is there a weakness, a vulnerability? Is there a likelihood, right, a risk that it could happen? And, uh, and so, you know, it could be theft, as I've mentioned before. It could be sabotage. It could be somebody, uh, you know, just destroying your facilities. Uh, you know, there's a lot of things that can go on, um, especially when you, we, uh, we see a lot of that kind of uh, uh, news reported more and more often. Social engineering, probably, easily. At one point, I used to say to people that this was uh, almost 50% of what hackers did. Uh, social engineering attacks are where people are trying to get information out of other people. Now, there's a number of ways that can be done. It could be that somebody is just watching with their eyes while you're typing in uh, uh, a password. They call that shoulder surfing. Uh, or, you know, maybe you're just being nosy. Who knows? Uh, they could uh, be uh, calling you on the phone and asking you for your password, trying to impersonate somebody from IT, and they're trying to fix a system. Uh, it could be somebody eavesdropping and just listening to uh, a conversation. Uh, I mean, I have learned passwords for uh, at least one airline um, by just listening to a house, you know, somebody that works at the, um, at the airline said, hey, I need the uh, password for the uh, computer and baggage claim. And, you know, I heard that on a walkie-talkie, no less, and I heard it back, and, you know, so I'm hoping they changed the password. 
Um, I was at a cell phone store and, and I heard uh, one person say, hey, what's uh, the manager's password? And the other person who wasn't the manager knew. So, you know, again, lots of weaknesses there, but eavesdropping is another great way of doing that. I, and it just goes on and on. It could even be dumpster diving, looking in the trash to see what you've thrown away. That might help me uh, better fool you. Now, a lot of us, at least me, seems that I'm spending a lot of time on network-based attacks. Uh, I, I say that because, you know, I've, I've worked for uh, so many companies who will have their variety of routers or switches or, uh, well, that was a pretty bad looking switch there, uh, or a firewall, uh, or, you know, something that does all in one. It could also uh, be, you know, some of what they call this uh, next generation firewalls that might do AV and IDS. And, and so a lot of people are spending a lot of time in trying to secure those types of networks. And that is, uh, like I said, probably one of the big ones. Of course, I do like to do a lot of social engineering as well. I'm not so much into breaking into things. I just showed people how to pick locks. Uh, but anyway, so network-based attacks. Uh, they seem like that's the one we hear a lot about, right? You hear about the uh, big uh, warehouses and retail stores losing all those uh, accounts. Well, they all kind of came based on uh, somehow across the network. Uh, another great way to break in, though, of course, here is through web pages. You'll see people trying to take care of a poorly uh, uh, designed uh, uh, page by doing sometimes what they call SQL injection which is taking advantage of somebody forgetting to encode security, uh, either at the web page or to the database server that sits behind the web page that delivers the information back and forth. So it could be certainly a uh, web-based application. Or, you know, to me, software-based attack is still pretty much trying to say the same thing as a web application, except for we could probably throw in all the operating systems in here uh, and say, you know, what are their weaknesses? And again, I know that some, some people out there love to make uh, jokes about Windows and, and not being secure. You know, Windows is a great operating system. Uh, it, you know, it's got its flaws like every vendor. I mean, you can't tell me that you're going to use Linux because it's more secure because it's really not. You can't say, oh, my Mac is, you know, all right. Everybody has a weakness. There's no perfect uh, uh, operating system or program. And sometimes the operating system might be the strongest operating system you, out, you have out there, but there's an application running like uh, the one you use to check your email. And, and so that person will attack the application because the application is trusted by the operating system and therefore uh, there's a weakness. So anyway, I'm trying to just give you a number of ideas of uh, the types of attacks and what we mean. And I hope that you see again a little bit mild, uh, mile wide because we went from uh, physical security to uh, eavesdropping, listening, calling on the phone to uh, hitting you through the network or if the network's good, going through an application or going through a web page, you know, lots of different types of attacks. And, uh, and none of those are actually even on people, on your personnel. Uh, again, that could be a very uh, dangerous world out there for people who might be in uh, uh, a place of authority for a company and worrying about uh, getting kidnapped or those types of things. All right, so controls, I mostly want to talk about kind of the way in which we could uh, classify them. Uh, but a control is what we call a countermeasure. Uh, the idea of a countermeasure is to um, basically mitigate or lessen the amount of risk that you have to uh, worry about. And it's, so it's something we would do or put in place, as I said, to uh, make that risk uh, less. Obviously, we could say that a bunch of them are preventive. All right, so, you know, in this case, a preventive control would be locking things, locking doors. Uh, but I've already told you again, you have to be worried about the types of locks and where, you know, you can access that lock from. Um, you know, so that's prevention. And even, by the way, the best control systems can be easily thwarted by the people that are working there. Um, maybe I have too many stories and you all don't want to hear my stories because you don't get a chance to tell me yours. But you're my captive audience, so you're going to listen to mine. Uh, I was at this um, uh, uh, basically worldwide uh, multinational company, I won't say which one it was, doing some uh, consulting work on uh, a network management system that they had. And, um, but I didn't have access to the network operations center, the NOC. So one day I was bored, and I was walking the hallways down in the, um, the basement area, and I saw one door that had no label. You know like how doors would normally have a label and tell you what's in there? Well, this door didn't have any, uh, so uh, right away I knew it had to be the NOC because uh, somebody once said, uh, you know, in security you shouldn't, uh, 
you shouldn't uh, put that information on the outside of the door. And I had a little window right here, a little window that I could look into. And when I looked into that window, uh, it uh, showed me there was another door. There was also a podium, which looked like a fingerprint or palm scanner. And I could see that it was a keypad uh, for that door. So uh, they basically were being forced to uh, have a magnetic key card to get through the front door. Uh, you know, palm print. I mean, oh, perfect, right? And so uh, here's Ken. All right, I, I, I'm not this skinny, but anyway, here I am looking in that window trying to see uh, what was in there. And some guy walked up behind me and said, hey, can I help you? Scared me, made me jump. Uh, and I just told him, you know, I said, here's who I am. I could have lied because my, my uh, tag only said visitor. Uh, anyway, so he takes me in, shows me the network operating system, uh, best security in the world. He just let me right in, which is nice, but I didn't do anything bad. But I just want to throw that out there. Uh, detection controls. All right, detection. Well, all right, so what do we have here? Closed circuit TV as an example. Um, you know, again, it could be uh, an alarm on a door, an alarm on the uh, window. So if somebody opens it or breaks it, that uh, there's some sort of detection. And, of course, hopefully some of the controls can correct things. You know, like firewalls can drop packets or intrusion detection can uh, de drop those packets. They can send out emails. Uh, the alarm company could be calling the police when they uh, detect something. Right, so that's part of the correction. That after we, well, we try to prevent it, we have a way to detect it. And from there, have a way to correct it. Hopefully, our control can help us with all of those things. So as a review, when we're talking about these controls, and I hopefully gave you a big enough breakdown there, uh, that we do classify them as prevention, detection, and correction. And if we're lucky, our controls can help with each of these aspects. But remember, they usually have a primary function. Like I said, a lock on a door is generally there to prevent you from getting in there. Detection would be an alarm strip on the door so we know when it's open. And that uh, device, hopefully relaying it to a machine or to a person, would be the correction. And again, that's just one example on a physical security side. When we take a look at the uh, idea of the management process for security, uh, as a process, it means it's something that kind of, um, I almost want to look at it instead of just a circle as kind of a spiral staircase. I mean, we're still going around. One thing leads to another, but we're always getting better or higher up the staircase as we're, we're uh, approaching it. Uh, and then, of course, for those of you who think the uh, glass is half empty, you'll say, oh, it could be going down. Well, all right, you could be, but take my analogy. Uh, anyway, one of the things, of course, that we want to look at uh, when it comes to security is uh, knowing that we have to have a way to identify what those issues are. And uh, from, those, uh, from that identification, right, to be able to report this and to monitor it. And, uh, and depending on what we see, having to go back through this entire life cycle of, uh, of being able to know what it is, how to implement a, a security control, monitor the control for success, which is a part of auditing. And from that, maybe have to make new recommendations so we keep going through this process.